Hello and welcome to Morning the Narrative. I am McBulo. The show will feature the top news of the week, complete with my observations, and even a little bit of snapcasm thrown in. The top news stories will be taken from my morning news briefings that I write on the, on the Rick Bulo new media blog every weekday morning. If you go on to like what you see, smash that thumbs up button. And now, let's go right into the news. There's a battle in the Republican Party going on, and it's those who support Donald Trump versus those who do not. Those leading, leading the charge who do not support Donald Trump is Wyoming Senator Liz Cheney, daughter of former Vice President Dick Cheney. And she looks be on, on her way out of leadership position in, in the House. This coming from my good friends over at townhall.com and Rebecca Downs. Could we soon see Liz Cheney gone from leadership? Republican Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who is the chair of the House Republican Conference and the third highest ranking Republican in the U.S. House, has found herself in quite a bit in the news, quite a bit lately. Matt reported last week that she think that she said she thinks she may even run for president in 2024. After being particularly vocal in impeaching Trump the second time round, while she continues to trash him to this day, well, well, Republican leaders have had enough of her and they may even be willing to push her out, according to Axios. On Saturday, Jonathan Swan, Glenn Johnson, and, El and Elena Treen reported, Scoop GOP leaders threaten Cheney Ouster. Honestly, it sounds like House Republican leader... Kevin McCarthy of California and Republican leader, or Republican rep rather, Steve Scalise of Louisiana, the highest and second highest ranking Republicans in the House, respectively, have been fed up with it for some time. Perhaps Cheney's most vocal opponent for the time being is Republican Representative Jim Banks of Indiana, chairman of the Republican Study Committee. He called the Congresswoman out for the unwelcome distraction that, that she is. What they're saying, Banks said such, such statements detracted from a unified focus about how to beat the Democrats in the 2022 midterms. That's what we got out of Liz Cheney, which doesn't help us remain focused on that single goal, the congressman said during an interview here off of Axios. Her lack of focus is that while being focused on other things and proving her point was an unwelcome distraction. The sort of sideline distractions at the GOP retreat will only serve the blog to hold us back from being focused on that nearly unanimous goal we have as a conference, Banks added. Asked whether he thought Cheney, who serves in the number in the number, in the number three party role as GOP conference chair, will retain that position in a month, Banks said, I don't know. That's up to her, he added. I think a lot of us would like to see her join the team, be on the same team, same mission, the same focus. And at this point, that's what many of us are questioning. Banks said his view did, doesn't just go up the leadership ranks, but also down through the GO, House GOP rank and file. The Republican Study Committee has 154 members, the largest group among the 212 Republicans currently serving in the House. For what is what Cheney called a memo, Rep Representative Banks wrote, Neo Marxist, associated that kind of name calling, which came from Trump, though. Now Representative Cheney did hold on to her leadership role pretty handily, with a healthy margin in a secret battle of 145 to 61. This chatter may be another warning to come on now, cut it out, but seriously, Liz Cheney, cut it out. It's been a week for random moves in the news. Actually, as I covered last night, Senator Mitt Romney was booed during the Utah GOP convention, though a resolution to censure him ultimately failed. Senator Susan Collins of Maine said during her State of the Union appearance that she was a policy Romney booed. She also called Representative Cheney as a woman of strength and conscience. And she did what she felt was right and I salute her for that. We need to be accept accepting of differences in our party. We don't want to become too much like the Democrat Party which has been taken over by the progressive left. Here's a tweet from State of the Union at CNN, SOTU. Republican Senator Susan Collins said she was appalled by the Utah GOP bullying, booing, and attempting to censure Senator Mitt Romney. We are not a party that is led by just one person.
And yeah, I'm, I'm not much of a Liz Cheney fan, you know. However, I do think it'll be interesting to see just what comes out of that, especially as far as the whole thing where Jim Banks and Kevin McCarthy goes. But speaking of the the article from Axios, here it is. And it's called Scoop GOP Leaders Threaten Cheney Ouster. This by Jonathan Swan, Glenn Johnson, and, and Elena Treen. Top Republicans are turning on Representative Liz Cheney, the party's highest ranking woman in Congress, with one conservative leader suggesting that she could be outed from her GOP post within a month. Why it matters, the comments by, G- by Representative Steve Scalise, the minority rep, and Jim Banks, chairman of the Republican Senate Study Committee, carry away because of a close relationship with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy of California, who is openly feuding with, with Cheney. Banks, Republican of Indiana, leader of the largest conservative caucus in the, in the House, told Axios Friday that Cheney's continued criticisms are an unwelcome distraction, and he questioned whether she would retain her leadership all in a month. Banks' comments were echoed more diplomatically by Scalise of, of Louisiana, the, the number two Republican in the House. During an, an interview with Axios on Friday, he said of Cheney, this idea that you just disregard Donald Trump is not where we are, and frankly, he, he still has a lot to offer still. Now, earlier in the week, McCarthy himself told reporters, if you're sitting here at a retreat that's focused on policy, focus on the future of making America the next century, and you're talking about something else, you're not being productive. Cheney, Republican of Wyoming, told reporters during several interviews at a GOP retreat in Orlando, Florida, that anyone challenging the 2020 election results should be disqualified from a presidential campaign in, in 2024, and that she herself would not rule out of one. She also said a commission to examine the January 6th Capitol insurrection should be narrowly focused, not the mind raging rope pro McCarthy favors. In addition, Cheney characterized a memo Banks wrote about how the party could retain working class voters as neo Marxist. What they're saying, Banks said, such comments it's detracted from a unified focus about how to be the Republican or how to, about how to, how to, how to be the Democrats in the 2022 midterms. That's what, that's what we got out of Liz Cheney, which doesn't help us remain focused on that single goal that Congressman said during an, an interview he offered to Axios. Her lack of focus on that while being focused on other things and proving her point was an unwelcome distraction. The, this sort of sideline distractions at the GOP retreat only served to hold us back from being focused on the nearly unanimous goal we have as a conference bank added. He asked whether he thought Cheney, who serves as the number three party role as the GOP conference here, will retain that position in a month. Banks said, I don't know. That's up to her, he added. I think a lot of us would like to see her join the team, be on the same team, same mission, the same focus. And, and, and at this point, that's what many of us are questioning. Banks said his view doesn't just go up the leadership ranks, but down to the GOP rank and file. The Republican Study Committee has 154 members, the largest group among the 212 Republicans currently serving in the House. But, but, but McCarthy and Cheney have been at odds publicly since the, since she both favored and since she both favored, voted in favor of Trump's second impeachment and blamed him for the January 6th assault. McCarthy initially faulted Trump for inciting the mob, but later backed off and visited him at Mar-a-Lago, where he, as he sought the former president's help in running back the House next year. In February, the House GOP conference held a secret ballot about whether to retain Cheney in her current role, and she went overwhelmingly, 145 to 61. A Cheney spokesperson declined to comment on Banks' criticisms, while Cheney says she is also committed to regaining Republican control of the House in 2022. She noted Trump lost the White House in 2020, while the GOP also lost control of the Senate. Now the other side. Whatever conference decides we should do it quickly, because I don't think anyone who believes this dynamic is particularly healthy right now, 
said Republican Representative Anthony Gonzalez of Ohio. As for me, I think bigger. I think having diverse perspectives in leadership is important. It means we can have a bigger tent, with such that we are not turning people away from the party who would otherwise be inclined to support us. Given that we are completely out of power, we need to be responsibly adding to as, as many voices and voters as possible, not subtracting them. And there's also this from Politico. McCarthy and Cheney was apart after a photo retreat. Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy called on his conference to unite, but he and Representative Liz Cheney are still at odds over former President Donald Trump. This by Melanie, Melanie Zanona. Orlando House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy spent three days urging his Republicans to stay united if they want to take back the majority. But his own relationship with one of his top deputies is breaking apart over, over former President Donald Trump. At a retreat meant to, co to craft a cohesive message, McCarthy of California and GOP conference here, Liz Cheney of Wyoming, illustrated the exact rift the party is of, or has fought to avoid. While the former president wasn't even invited to the House GOP's annual policy retreat here in the Sunshine State, his presence has loomed large over the gathering. McCarthy Edwin asked whether it's difficult to have harmony in his ranks when Cheney has been so vocal with the viewpoints on Trump. Offered up some thinly veiled criticism. It's a responsibility. If you're going to be in leadership, leaders eat last, McCarthy told Politico in a wide ranging interview on Monday. By the way, this article was written back on April 26th. So just a couple weeks ago. And it says. And when leaders try to go out and network as one team, it creates difficulties. The California Republican also said he's fairly approached Cheney about toning down some of her remarks. When asked whether Cheney has heeded the advice, McCarthy responded, you be the judge. And at a Tuesday press conference, McCarthy, who has urged, urged Republicans not to attack each other, took another public whack at Cheney. As if she was a good fit for his, lead, for his leadership team, McCarthy first said it's a question for the House GOP conference. His members voted less than three months ago to keep Cheney in her leadership spot at McCarthy's own urging. Then when pressed for his personal opinion on the matter, McCarthy told a room full of reporters that if you're sitting here at a retreat, that's focus on policy. Focus on the future of making America next century and you're talking about something else, you're not being productive. Cheney has addressed policy during her time in the Sunshine State but not shed away from questions about Trump. She told the New York Post on Monday that she believes support for Trump back challenges to the certification of the 2020 election should be disqualifying for any 2024 Republican presidential nominee. The growing gulf between McKinney and McCarthy is emblematic of the broader split in the party right now over the former president. And while Hardy knew the Cheney McCarthy schism on full display in sunny Florida, is particularly glaring because it came amid Republican calls for unity as they plotted their path back to power. Over the past three days, House Republicans at the retreat have been buzzing about Cheney, which generated headline after headline since her flight touched down. She's the topic of every private conversation, said one GOP lawmaker. To be fair, Cheney made news responding to questions from reporters, but the spectacle, whether intentional or, intentional or not, is a welcome distraction for her party. Cheney also told the Post that she's a ruling on a presidential run. And at a press conference earlier that morning, Cheney, who was one of 10 Republicans who voted to impeach Trump, publicly broke, broke with McCarthy over the scope of a commission investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. McCarthy wants a broader scope that explores all kinds of political violence, including the protests that erupted last summer in response to police brutality but Cheney has called for a different approach, arguing that the commission tends to be tightly focused or needs to be tightly focused on January 6th. If we minimize what happened on January 6th and, we, and if we appease it, then we will be in a situation where every election cycle we could potentially have another constitutional crisis, Cheney said later in an interview with Politico. If you get into a situation where we don't guarantee a transfer of power, we won't have learned the lessons of January 6th. And you can't bury our head in the sand, she added. It matters usually to the survival of the country. 
McCarthy and Cheney have insisted that they have a good working relationship and, there, and that there is no b- bad blood. Cheney also went to bed for when, McCarthy also went to bed for Cheney when some of Trump's acolytes unsuccessfully tried to oust her from her leadership job. But there are clear signs that the pair's relationship is more fussy than ever. McCarthy has notably stopped appearing at GOP leadership's weekly press conferences with Cheney ever since the awkward moment on February 25th when they clashed over Trump's role in the party. McCarthy also hasn't re- committed to defending Cheney from looming primary challenges. Telling reporters in February, Liz hasn't asked me. He was asked again on Tuesday whether he'd campaign on Cheney's behalf if she asked him, but McCarthy said he hadn't talked to her about it. While Trump wasn't invited to the retreat this time around because it was more focused on policy, McCarthy is ruling on inviting him to the next gathering. McCarthy also said he was trying to get Trump to film a video for play, to play for the conference, but it didn't pan out. Some, but some of Republicans wish Trump had, played, had been a bigger focal point of the three-day retreat. Remember when, remember when Republicans sought the House in 2018 because a bunch of them distanced themselves from President Trump? Tweeted freshman Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, who hosted a Mar-a-Lago fundraiser on Saturday. Not inviting President Trump to the GOP retreat is the same stupid behavior. Funny how they don't understand a, number, a record number of votes and support for any re- Republican president. And that's totally true. I mean, you know, you know, it's interesting that, you know, that she said it's the same stupid behavior and how many re- Republicans don't understand that an American number of votes in support of any Republican president, at least though, you know, those in the House that is, having, having, I haven't understood that, but, you know, there, I said it before and I'll say it again, we have another about two years until we see everyone lining up. Could Cheney run? I don't know. Could, could Trump run? Again, I don't know. It's up to him. But all that matters is that, you know, just... Sit back and have popcorn ready. And then there's this from the Political Insider report. Report Liz Cheney's leadership role in peril as criticism from GOP colleagues mounts. This by Rusty Wise and, and, and reported on Saturday. Business Insider is reporting that a wave of recent criticism from GOP colleagues has the future of anti-Trump Representative Liz Cheney very much in doubt. The past few weeks have seen a cascade of developments that seriously imperil Cheney's leadership role and her future within the party they write. The report adds that it is a stunning reversal for a candidate who in the past has been touted as a potential House Speaker, U.S. Senator or President, GOP buoys the, the reporting by the Business Insider noting House Re- Republican leader Kevin McCarthy of California declined to endorse Cheney when asked whether she was a good fit for leadership. They reference a pair of other Republican lawmakers who believe Cheney is not speaking for the, com- for the conference despite being the, the number three House, House Republican. CNN Politics tweeting out uh, on April 30th. Representative Liz Cheney is once again facing the ire of her colleagues and GOP voters, laying bare the ongoing and internal divisions within the GOP about how Republicans should move forward in the wake of former President Donald Trump. Criticism of Liz Cheney. The Business Insider notes that Liz Cheney received a wave of criticism after she voted to impeach former President Donald Trump due to his alleged incitement of the Capitol protests. Still in February, the House where the caucus voted 145 to 61 to keep her in a leadership role rather than try to unite the party around in the set of shared conservative goals championed by Trump. Cheney has insisted on keeping up the attacks on the, on the former president. She accused possible Republican presidential candidates in 2014 
of engaging in disqualifying behavior by objecting to the certification of electoral votes in January. I do think that some of our candidates who led the church, particularly the senators who led the unconstitutional church, not to certify the election, you know, in my view, that's disqualifying. Cheney told the, told the, told the, the New York Post. Now, this is news tweeted out on April 27th. Liz Cheney thinks Republican lawmakers like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, who led the charge and objecting to the certification of President Biden's 2020 election win, is enough to disqualify them from running for president. I'll get, I'll get to that in, in a few minutes here. Cheney also took a ton of heat for being caught giving Joe Biden a fist bump before the president's address before a joint session of Congress last week. Republican warmonger Liz Cheney gave Sleepy Joe a fist bump after he delivered a radical socialist vision for the future of America. So glad she's in the GOP leadership. I guess they wanted to be, to be more inclusive and for Democrats in there too. That a tweet from Donald Trump Jr. on April 29th. Cheney, in another interview last week, doubled down on her impeachment vote and said she'd run on impeaching Trump every day of the week. Lance Gooden tweeted out this past Saturday, Liz Cheney has promised she will campaign on impeaching Trump every day of the week. Good luck on that, Liz. Prediction she'll be out of, the, out of her GOP leadership role by month's end. And no support in her own caucus. Representative Lance Gooden of, of Texas wasn't shy about making a prediction for Cheney's future, saying she'll be out of a GOP leadership at month's end. Senator Josh Hawley mocked Cheney's White House aspirations recently, saying she doesn't speak for poor rep Republicans and has no support in her own caucus. This in a tweet from Manu Raju on April 27th. Asked Josh Hawley about Cheney's criticism of him, and, say, and he said she is really out of step with GOP voters and members. This is somebody who has no support in her own caucus, who has hung her, her own members out to dry over and over. I think she's on an island. Trump also took a shot at Cheney, calling her a warmongering fool. Liz Cheney is pulling so low in Wyoming and has so little support. Even from the Wyoming Republican Party that she is looking for a way out of her congressional race, he claimed in a statement. Molly Hemingway of, of, the, of the Federalist tweeted out on April 27. Former President Donald Trump says Republican conference here Liz Cheney is a warmongering fool who wants to stay in the Middle East and Afghanistan for another 19 years. And is worried about rejection by her Wyoming constituents where she is polling poorly. Even McCarthy, who publicly backed Cheney, remaining in leadership just two months ago, refused to endorse her as a good fit for, for party leadership. That's a question for the conference, he said. Cheney refused to rule out a future run for president of the United States when asked by the New York Post. I'm not ruling anything in her out ever. It's a long time, she told the newspaper. Her actions in, in the past several months all but guarantee she has no chance of winning the Republican nomination. And that from Rusty Wise over at the political over at the political insider. Now, the Wyoming race is another race that I think every Republican should have eyes on. You know, I mean, it'll be interesting to see just just what Liz Cheney does in twenty twenty two. You know whether she wins or not, it's up to it's up to her and her and her campaign. But yeah, yeah, that, that's my take on the situation. Let me know what what you think in the comments below. Do you like Liz Cheney? Do you think she'll remain in, in high in the as conference chair? Do you think she'll run in twenty twenty four? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next video. What well, might come as a surprise and a shock to some people, but not for others. Bill and Melinda Gates are getting a divorce. This from businessinsider.com, and it says, Bill and, Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates are ending their marriage after 27 years. Bill and Melinda Gates married in 1994 and announced on Monday that they were divorcing. 
The Gates spent much of their $130 billion, with a B billion dollar fortune on charity via the Bill and Melinda Foundation. The pair have three children date together and plan to work and plan to continue work on their chari- charitable foundation. Bill and Melinda Gates winning the marriage of 27 years. Melinda Gates and the Microsoft co-founder both tweeted on Monday a statement announcing the, the, the divorce. This in a tweet from Bill Gates. After a great deal of thought and a lot of work on our relationship, we have made the, the decision to turn our marriage, our statement said. Over the last 27 years, we have raised three incredible children and with a foundation that works all over the world to enable people to lead healthy, productive lives. The philanthropists say, said in the statement that they plan to continue continue to work together on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The pair married in 1994, seven years after Melinda Gates joined Microsoft as a product manager. When Bill Gates initially asked her out, he inquired if they could go out two weeks from tonight. Melinda Gates said, I have no idea what I'm doing two weeks from tonight. Bill Gates responded, you're not spontaneous enough for me. After taking her number, he ended up calling her that same day. They have three children together, including one who is a nationally ranked equestrian show jumper. Each of the Gates' ten, each of the Gates children will inherit $10 million, Bill Gates has said. And the rest of the Gates' fortune will go to charity. About the time the pair met, Microsoft had a market capital, capitalization of about $35 billion. Now that figure is almost $2 billion, and Microsoft is one of the, is one of the most valuable companies. Bill Gates has, a net, has an estimated net worth of $124 billion, which grew from $98 billion in 2020, according to Forbes. He is fourth on the outlet's ranking of the world's billionaires. Forbes named Melinda Gates one of the, one of the most powerful women in philanthropy, placing her fifth at the number five spot on its Power of Women 2020 list. Melinda Gates has changed her Twitter profile name to Melinda French Gates, incorporating her maiden name into the moniker. The Gates, the Gates have long said that they will spend their fortune on philanthropic causes, particularly through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They launched into the organization in 2020 and they have given billions to global health, poverty, and education. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has donated up to of $250 million to coronavirus response efforts since the pandemic began in March 2020. A spokesman, a spokesperson from the foundation, told Insider in an email that Bill and Melinda, and Melinda Gates will remain co-chairs and trustees of the, of the organization, and will continue to work together. No changes have been a plan for their roles in the in light of the news of their divorce. In 2010, they felt they launched the Giving Pledge with the with the billionaire investor Warren Buffett. A commitment to give most of their wealth to charity during their lifetime or pledged to do so after their death. Details about the divorce are unclear, but the resulting settlement or settlement could be one of the largest ever. When Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and his wife McKenzie split up in 2019, their settlement was $38 billion. The settlement made McKenzie Scott the world the third wealthiest woman. The Gates' split is likely to lead to questions from those in the nonprofit world wondering how, if not all, of the of the foundation's decision making around investments would, would be affected. And there's also this from the Wall Street Journal on it. Microsoft Corporation co-founder. Uh, this is just a short clip because it's behind a paywall, but here's a here's just a short clip of it. Microsoft Corporation co-founder Bill Gates and his wife Melinda Gates, who is co-chair of the Philanthropic Foundation, are running their 27-year marriage, according to a statement posted on both their verified Twitter accounts. After a great deal of thought and a lot of work in, on our relationship, we have made the, 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 the decision to end our marriage, said the statement, which was signed by both people. The couple on Monday filed a divorce petition in King County Superior Court in Washington State. The filing indicated that, indicated that they have a separation agreement under which they plan to divide their assets. The couple have three children together and jointly formed the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which oversees the charitable, 
the charitable ventures to which the billionaire philanthropist couple have devoted their fortune. And yeah, so I mean, it, well, it's something that I may that I might not be a, be too heavily invested in. You know, you, you know, you know, this this is making news because it's two of the wealthiest people in, in America and around the world, and they're for. Their philanthropists. Sometimes, you know, there are rumors swirling around around them. You know, with them being involved with 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 the late Jeffrey Epstein. But you know, that's something that I'm not going to delve into uh, at this point in time. However, this is definitely something to look in. This is definitely this is definitely something to keep on the radar. This coming from NBC News, Melinda Gates's petition for divorce says marriage to Bill is irretrievably broken. She added that spousal support is not needed. A separation contract will determine property divisions, according to the document. Melinda Gates said her marriage to Bill Gates is irretrievably broken, according to, to, court, to court documents obtained Tuesday by NBC News. In her petition for a divorce, fall of money in King County, Washington, she says spousal support is not needed and a separation contract will determine property divisions. We ask the court to dissolve a marriage and find that our marital community ended on the day stated on a, in a separation contract according to the document. Now, it's not clear from the petition when the couple separated or if they had a prenuptial agreement. Bill Gates, 65, and Melinda Gates, 56, first announced their divorce Monday in a joint settlement. The pair who married on New Year's Day in Hawaii in 1994 said so they no longer believe we can grow together as a couple in this next next phase of our lives. Bill Gates tweeted out, after a great deal of thought and a lot of work on our relationship, we have made the decision to run our marriage, they said in the statement. Over the last 27 years, we have raised three incredible children and built a foundation that works all over the, all over the world to enable all, all people to, to lead healthy, productive lives. And there, and, and there's a pic there also. Jennifer Catherine Gates, 25, the oldest of her siblings, wrote in a statement that it has been a challenging search of time for our whole family. I'm still learning to, to how, how to best support my own process and emotions as well as family members at this time, she wrote. The couple in 2000 founded the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a private philanthropic organization with that funds research and advocacy work across the globe, including in some of the world's most impoverished nations. The foundation has given billions to support issues like global health, development and education, as well as combating climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Bill Gates, who, found, who co-founded Microsoft in 1975 and served as the chief executive until 2020, stepped down from the company's board last year and has since focused the majority of his efforts on philanthropy. Now, he still owns roughly 1.3% of Microsoft's shares. His net, work, his net worth is roughly $130 billion, according to Forbes, making him the fourth richest person in the world. The Gates Foundation's assets are nearly $50 billion, according to his financial statements. And it's been considered the world's largest private philanthropic organization over for the past 20 years. It issued about $5 billion in grants annually between 2018 and 2019. In, a in their statement in announcing their split, the couple who were co-chairs of the foundation said that they would continue to work together in the, in the philanthropic mission. Okay, so basically, you know, getting a divorce, but working, but still we're working on, on the foundation. Might be interesting to, to, to see just how they handle that and, and how they go about work, working that out. And this coming from Forbes.com, how the Gates' split could stack up against the biggest billionaire divorces. Bill and Melinda Gates, the influential couple in charge of the world's largest private foundation, they're divorcing after 27 years of marriage, the pair said Monday in separate announcements on Twitter. In the, in, the, in the divorce filing, the couple said their marriage is, is irretrievably broken. Bill and Melinda will, will remain co-chairs of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
and they will continue to work together to shape the strategies of the foundation and set the organization's direction according to a spokesperson. The Shack announcement leaves several questions about the Gates' fortune unanswered. It's unclear how the couple will divide their assets or whether they send a prenup, but due to the sheer size, but due to the sheer size of their fortune, the split will, will likely be one of the largest divorce settlements in history. Bill Gates, who in 19 and then 75 founded Microsoft, is worth $130.5 billion, making him the fourth richest person in the world, according to Forbes. Gates became the, the, the world's very richest person with a $12.9 billion fortune in 1995, one year after he married Melinda. According to the divorce petition, Bill and Melinda are currently separated and signed a contract, dictating how the couple will handle finances while living apart. They asked the court to divide their assets based on the terms of the separation contract, but the details of the contract weren't disclosed. The filing does not mention a prenup, but that doesn't mean that they don't have one, since they are not obli obligated to, do, to disclose everything on the filing. Complicating matters is the fact that Washington, where the Gates family resides, is a community property state. That means all assets acquired by either party during a marriage are considered communal and typically split equally during divorce in the absence of a prenup. Though in Washington, the parties can agree to divide their assets in a way that is just and equitable, which can result in settlements that aren't necessarily 50-50. Janet George, a divorce attorney at Washington-based firm McKinley Irvin, or Irvin, told Forbes, take, Bezos, take Jeff Bezos and his wife Mackenzie. Jeff gave Mackenzie one quarter of his Amazon stake in their divorce settlement. If Bill and Melinda did decide to split the fortune equally, Melinda would be worth sixty-five and a quarter billion dollars, which which would be more than Mackenzie Scott, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, who is worth fifty-nine point eight billion. By the way, Scott did donate nearly six billion dollars of her fortune to charitable entities last year. Now Forbes has some of the list of the of the largest billionaire dis disunions on record. At least where we can follow the money, and in, in some cases, like the split between Google's Sergey Brin and Ann Wojcicki, we won't know the size of the seven because the, the divorce filings are unsealed. Below are the five largest settlements in descending order. Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott, number one, are, are number one are, with at least $35 billion. The couple met while both were working on the, at the hedge fund DE Shaw in New York. After they moved to Seattle, McKenzie helped Jeff get Amazon off the ground. In 2019, they announced the terms of their divorce. She received about 4% of, of Amazon's per outstanding shares, with, with over $35 billion in 2019 when the settlement was announced, and far more now with Amazon stock nearly up 75% since then. Jeff, Jeff held on to all of the rocket company Blue Origin and the Washington Post. Once the divorce was finalized, Mackenzie, who changed her last name to Scott in 2020 and got remarried in, 20, in March 2021, became the world's third richest woman. Number two is Bill and Sue Gross, who had $1.3 billion. The Gross's messy split minted a new billionaire and dragged down another. Sue filed for, for divorce in 2016 from her husband, the founder of asset manager Pimco, and she walked away with a $1.3 billion fortune. That haul included a $36 million Laguna Beach house in Le Repos, a contested 1932 Picasso painting that she later sold for $35 million. While Bill tried to hang on to one of those three pet cats, who eventually got custody of all of them. Bill lost his spot on the Forbes 400 in 2018, following 14 consecutive years on the list. Both now run their own charitable vehicles. Stephen and Elaine Winner at number three with, 80, with 850 million. The co-founders of the casino giant Win Resorts divorced for the second time in 2010. The divorce dictated that Elaine, a Win Resorts board member since 2002, receive 11 million shares. Then worth an estimated 800 or 795 million. Steve also sold about 114 million in stock that year. Some, if not all, went to Elaine as part of the deal. She then sued Win Win Resorts to sell part of her 9% stake and was kicked off the board three years later amid an, an ugly proxy battle. After Steve stepped down as CEO and chairman in February 2018 amid sexual harassment allegations that he has denied, he sold all his shares. 
Elaine, now worth $2.3 billion, is Win Resorts' largest individual shareholder. Number four, Hillham and Sue Ann are now $975 million. After three years of bitter divorce, or court proceedings, oil, oil tycoon Hill in 2015 tried to finally end his 26-year marriage with Sue Ann, no prenup, by writing her a check in the amount of $974 million, $17.17 from his Morgan Stanley account. She deposited it, but then changed her mind, decided she wanted more, and filed an appeal seeking a bigger share of the then $13.7 billion fortune tied to Ham's 75% ownership in publicly traded continental resources. In April 2015, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ended the saga, granting Harold's motion to dismiss her appeal, reasoning from precedent that Sue Ann had agreed to the settlement by signing and depositing the check. Sue Ann subsequently funded a political action committee that succeeded in this effort to unseat the judge who presided over, over, the, over the, the, the divorce. Number five, Roy E. and Patricia Disney, $600 million. Roy and his wife filed for a divorce in 2017 at the ages of 77 and 72, respectively, after 52 years of marriage. Roy, a nephew of Walt Disney, was worth approximately $1.3 billion at the time. Previously, a Forbes 400 mainstay, he lost nearly half his fortune, and the president was dropped from the list. In 2008, she, he married and he married writer and producer Leslie Debnews. He died a year later. Patricia died in 2012. A family foundation with assets of $122 million as of 2018, bearing both their names and supports environmental and economic causes. Now, that's a whole lot of scratch right there. So this Bill and Melinda the, the divorce could, could rank up there possibly more than Jeff Bezos. But let me know down in the comments what, what you think about it. And I'll see you in the next video. A few weeks after Derek Chubbin was found guilty of second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter, as well as third-degree third murder. He's seeking a, a retrial. This coming from the Washington Post. Derek Chauvin's attorney files motion for a new trial, alleging misconduct by judge, prosecution, and jurors. And... This by Holly Bailey over at the Washington Post. The, the attorney for Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer convicted of murder in the death of George Floyd, filed for a new trial Tuesday alleging that misconduct by the judge, prosecutors, and jurors compromised his client's right to a fair trial. In his motion, Eric Nelson accused Hennepin County District Ju Court Judge Peter A. Cahill of abuse of discretion when he denied a defense re request to move the trial out of Minneapolis and later refused to sequester the jury, arguing the, the intense media coverage of Floyd's death both before and during the proceedings undermined the unfairness of the trial. Nelson also contends that Chauvin's defense was damaged by post-testimony, but pre-deliberation intimidation of the defense's expert witnesses, from which the jury was not insulated, not only did such acts escalate the potential for, for prejudice in these proceedings, they may result in a far-reaching chilling effort on, def on defendant's ability to procure expert witnesses, especially in high-profile cases uh, such as those of Mr. Chauvin's co-defendants, to testify on their behalf, Nelson wrote. The publicity was so pervasive and so prejudicial before and during this trial that it amounted to a structural def defect in the proceedings. Nelson said Cahill's refusal to sequester the jury before deliberations resulted in exposure to news coverage that was damaging to Chauvin as well as jury intimidation and potential for, for fear of retribution among jurors, though he did not, did not offer any evidence for his claim. The motion also calls for a hearing to investigate whether the jury committed misconduct, felt threatened or intimidated, felt raised based pressure during the proceedings, and or failed to adhere to instructions during deliberations. The request comes out comes several days that is after one of the jurors, Brandon Mitchell, spoke out publicly about the panel's deliberations. 
Metro told several media outlets that jurors had wondered why Sherman didn't testify on his own behalf. A statement that some legal experts suggested could spark a defense motion to be questioned jurors about whether Chauvin's silence influenced their verdict. Cahill had told the jury that Chauvin's decision to not to testify should not figure into their decision making. Mitchell had also come under scrutiny in recent days after a photo stipulist had been wearing a Black Lives Matter t shirt while attending last year's March on Washington. A ceremony to celebrate or to commemorate Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous 1963 I Have a Dream speech. Mitchell told the Star Tribune that he indicated on his Euro questionnaire that he had not attended any protests regarding police brutality in Minneapolis after Floyd's death. He said he did not consider the DC match to be a protest or an event specifically about Floyd's death. Now, since filing, which was expected, false Cahill repeatedly for his handling of the trial. He argues that the judge should have admonished jurors to avoid all media, an instruction that Jake Cahill only, only gave later in the proceedings after word of a $27 million civil settlement between Floyd's family and the city of Minneapolis resulted in two seated jurors being dismissed during jury selection. Nelson said Cahill also violated Chauvin's rights to a fair trial when he declined to force Morris, Morris Lesser Hall. A passenger in Floyd's car the night he was killed to testify or to allow the defense center into evidence. Statements that Hall made to law enforcement after Floyd's death. Hall, who had allegedly stole drugs to Floyd in the past, invoked his constitutional right against self-incrimination by refusing to testify. His attorney argued that his testimony could open him up to a third-degree murder charge in Floyd's death, given the, the presence of drugs in Floyd's system. Nelson also accused Cale of allowing prosecutors to present or cumulative evidence on use of force and you know, giving the jury instructions that failed to accurately reflect the law, including uh, on use of force. Chauvin's attorney also accused prosecutors of pervasive prejudicial misconduct, in, including disparaging the, the defense and failing to adequately prepare his witnesses. John Stiles, a spokesman for Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, whose office oversaw the prosecution, dismissed Nelson's claims. The court has already rejected many of these arguments, and the state shall vigorously oppose them, Stiles said. Chauvin was found guilty last month of second-degree unintentional murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter in Floyd's May 2020 death, which came after the former officer knelt on, knelt on the man's neck and back for 9 minutes and 29 seconds during an arrest. Chauvin, who is being held in solitary confinement at a Minnesota prison while awaiting his June 25th sentencing, faces as much as 40 years under enhanced sentencing guidelines requested by the state. Now, people knew that they would come. I mean, I'm like, it's just, you know, that second step, but, you know, all appeals have to come eventually. And, I, and I'm thinking that this is what Chauvin is, is doing, is working the, the appeal system. And then there's also this from, N, from NBC News on, on the trial, and it says, Derek Chauvin files motion for new trial in George Floyd case, alleging jury misconduct. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin filed a motion for a new trial Tuesday after he was convicted last month of murdering George Floyd. Chauvin's attorney, Eric Nelson, is alleging pretrial publicity affected Chauvin's right to a fair trial. The motion alleges the court abused its, its discretion by denying the request for a change in venue in, in a new trial. Pretty much everything that I had made mention even he, although though this is in a, though there are some new things that in this it says in total the motion alleges eight abuses of discretion by the court. Now since filing also accuses Minnesota state prosecutors of committing pervasive prejudicial prosecutorial misconduct. It also alleged Chauvin's right to receive a fair trial, and it says that the jury. That the filing also impeached the, in order to impeach the verdict on the grounds that the jury committed misconduct, uh, felt, uh, felt threatened or intimidated, felt race-based pressure during the proceedings. 
Nelson said he, he that he had no comment on the motion. And last week, the first juror in Sherman's trial spoke out and described the evidence upon which the seven women and five men convicted the former officer as overwhelming. And there's this from the Daily Wire. Derek Chauvin's attorney files motion for new trial. You know, you know, it says here that that attorney Eric Nelson called for a new trial in, in the court filing on civil grounds, including an accusation that the court violated Chauvin's right to due process and fair trial when the court decided against requesting the jury and granting a venue change. From the filing, the court abused its discretion when it failed to sequester the jury for the duration of the trial, or in the least it managed them to avoid all media, which resulted in jury exposure to prejudicial publicity regarding the trial during the proceedings, as well as jury intimidation and potential fear of retribution among jurors, which violated Mr. Chauvin's constitutional rights to due process and a fair trial. Now, although Nelson did not give specific details in the ruling, Judge Peter Kale said previously that Chauvin C. may have grounds to overturn the trial on, on appeal in light of public remarks from Representative Nancy, Maxine Waters, Democrat of California, and and it talked about the the whole thing with Maurice Hall, you know, to testify. Though, so, but yeah like i said you you know we all know that we all know that this uh, that this would happen eventually so it, and that it'd just be a matter of time so it'll be interesting to see what 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 the judge says and also if it gets bumped up the bumped up the ladder but all of this is stemming from from um, as was mentioned in the Washington Post article, Chauvin trial juror participated in BLM protests last summer. This coming from the National Review. One of the jurors who served on the jury that, that, that returned a guilty verdict for Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd defended his presence at a, of a Black Lives Matter protest before the trial. Bannon Mitchell said he participated in the uh, in the August 28 event commemorating Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech delivered during the 1963 march on Washington, according to the Associated Press. Mitchell claimed that his reason for attending was that he had never visited Washington, D.C. before. I'd never been to D.C., he said. The opportunity to go to D.C., the opportunity, the opportunity to be around thousands and thousands of black people, I just thought it would be. I just thought it was a good opportunity to be a part of something. A photo circulating on social media depicted Mitchell sporting a Black Lives Matter shirt, featuring a picture of King in the face. Get your knee off her neck at the protest. Mitchell admitted he that he was present at the event. Speakers at the demonstration included family members of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Eric Garner who were all involved in fatal altercations with law enforcement officers. According to a schedule of the events, Mitchell was one of 12 jurors who convicted Chauvin out of all counts of second degree murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. A former center perspective jurors before selection included two questions pertaining to demonstrations. Mitchell said he responded to both. The first question asked, did you or did someone close to you participate in any of the demonstrations? War marches against police brutality that took place in Minneapolis after George Floyd's death. The second question asked, other than what you have already described above, have you or anyone close to you participated in protests about police use of force or police brutality? Mitchell said during jury selection that he had a very favorable view of Black Lives Matter. He also mentioned that he knew some police officers at his gym who were great guys and that he felt neutral about Blue Lives Matter a pro-police organization. I think I was being extremely honest for sure, Mitchell told the Star Tribune. I gave my views on everything on the case on Black Lives Matter. Mitchell's past protest activity could be used as, an, as a grounds for an appeal that Chauvin's constitutional right to an impartial jury was violated. Ted Samsel Jones, a Mitchell Hamlin School of Law professor, told the Associated Press, Speaking frankly, Chauvin did not have a fully impartial jury in the sense that we usually give criminal defendants 
Sam Sal Jones remarked, according to the Associated Press, that wasn't the, job, the fault of the judge or the prosecutors. It was simply a function of their incredible publicity and public pressure. Now, I I agree with the verdict. Yes, you, you, you know, Chauvin was guilty of of them. Now, do and I'm thinking that this that this appeal will be something to. To look at, you know, like I said, it was totally ex expected, you know, especially in light of what Congresswoman Waters had said. But let me know in the in, in the comments below your thoughts on on the on this juror. Do you think he that the that that there that there should be a new case? Do you think there shouldn't be? Do you think that there should do you think that if there is a, a new trial, that the case should be moved out of Minneapolis? Let me know what you think below, and I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday, Facebook had, uh, had shut down Trump's uh, appeal to to be to be reinstated to Facebook. This coming from NBCNews.com and Trump's Facebook ban appeal upheld by uh, Oversight Board. The board said that Facebook was just fed in suspending Mr. Trump's account, but that the country should reassess, but that the company should reassess its its decision to ban him indefinitely. This by David Ingram, Facebook was just put in demanding then President Donald Trump from his platform the day after the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol, but it needs to reassess how long the ban will remain in effect. The social network's quasi-independent oversight board said Wednesday, the decision to uphold the ban is a blow to Trump's hopes to post again on Facebook or, or, or Instagram anytime soon, but it opens the door to him eventually returning to the platforms. Facebook must complete a review of the length of the suspension within six months, the board said. Now, given the seriousness of the violations and ongoing risk of violence, Trump, Facebook was justified in suspending Mr. Trump's accounts on January 6 and extending that ex suspension on January 7, the board said in, in its decision. The board said that Trump created an environment where a serious risk of violence was possible by maintaining a narrative that the 2020 presidential election was fraudulent. The oversight board said, however, that it was not appropriate for Facebook to vary from its own from its normal penalties when it made the ban indefinite. Facebook's normal penalties include removing posts, imposing a limited suspension, or permanently disabling an account, the board said. Sorry about that. The ruling pushes Facebook to more clearly define what the penalties are for world leaders who violate, who violate its rules, a topic that has sparked worldwide debate even before Trump, and that hangs over the company as Trump considers his own future. The oversight board is clearly telling Facebook that they cannot invent new unwritten rules when it suits them, said Hillary Thorning Schmidt, a co-chair of the oversight board and a former prime minister of Denmark on a call with reporters. Nick Clegg, Facebook's Vice President of Global Affairs and Communications, said in a blog post responding to the board's criticism that the company will now consider the board's decision and determine an action that is clear and proportionate. In the meantime, Mr. Trump's accounts remain suspended, Clegg wrote. Trump, in a written statement responding to the decision, attacked the actions of Facebook, Twitter, and Google as a total disgrace and embarrassment. Free speech has been taken away from the President of the United States because the radical left lunatics are afraid of the truth. But the truth will come out, any, uh, come out anyway, bigger and stronger than ever, Trump said. The people of our country will not stand for it, he added. These corrupt social media companies must pay a political price and must never again be allowed to destroy and decimate our electoral process. Facebook created the oversight board last year as a kind of Supreme Court to hear appeals from users like Trump who have had their posts removed or who want to challenge other sensitive or contentious moderation decisions. 
the decisions of the board made up of 20 members from around the globe, and not binding with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has pledged to abide, to abide by what it says. Its decisions focus on two Trump posts from January 6th, both praising people involved in the Capitol attack, one telling the buyers, we love you, you are very special, and the other calling them great patriots and saying, remember this day forever. At the time of Mr. Trump's post, there was a clear immediate risk of harm and his words of support for those involved in the riots to legitimize their violent actions, the board said. The opinion reflected some dissent from within the board. A minority of the board would have gone further and ruled that Trump's posts were out of line, not only as a simple place for the, of the rioters, but as a call for action inciting violence. A minority also urged the board to take into account Trump's post from earlier in, in his presidency that contributed to racial tension and, and, ex, and, and exclusion, but a majority did, chose to decide the case on more limited grounds. The opinion also urges Facebook to launch an internal investigation to review its own potential contribution to the narrative of, of electoral fraud. The decision to, does not apply to Twitter, YouTube, or any of the other services that banned or restricted Trump in the break of the Capitol attack. The oversight, board, the oversight board's decision is likely to have become fodder for Republican lawmakers and other critics of the increasing power that Facebook and other tech companies wield over political debate and online speech. It could also be a far-reaching precedent for how, for how some of the Internet's biggest platforms treat the speech of world leaders and politicians. The board rejected the idea of a separate standard for political leaders, saying the same rules should apply to all users of the, of the platform, but context matters when assessing issues of, casual, of causality and the probability of an eminence of harm. Hundreds of people have been charged in connection with the January 6th riot in which an iron mob forced its way past Capitol Police officers and disrupted the counting of electoral college votes by Congress. Five people died, including a police officer who suffered two strokes. Some rioters said they were there to start a revolution against incoming President Joe Biden. Facebook restricted Trump's account within hours, announcing in a tweet at 8.36 p.m. Eastern that he would be blocked from posting for 24 hours because of two policy violations. The next day, Zuckerberg extended the suspension for at least two weeks, saying that Trump was using the platform to incite violent insurrection against a democratically elected government. We believe the risks in allowing the president to continue to use our service during this period are simply too great, Zuckerberg said in a Facebook post. The suspension has been in place ever since. Now, unlike Twitter, which banned Trump, Facebook and YouTube have not deleted his accounts. Trump has 35 million followers on Facebook, 24 million on, on Instagram, and 2.8 million on YouTube. On Twitter, he, he had 89, nearly 89 million. Trump has mostly kept a low profile since he left office. He has granted interviews to Fox News and Fox Business, issued statements to, to a spokesperson and launched a blog called From the Desk of Donald J. Trump. The Oversight Board's decision to help to flesh out a much broader debate about who gets to decide the rules for social media platforms Congressional Republicans, such as Ted Cruz of Texas, have pushed the idea that federal law ought to re require tech companies to be neutral in the content they allow, and at least one Supreme Court justice appears open to it. Last week, Florida's Republican legislature passed a first in the nation bill to punish tech companies that deplatform candidates for, for office with fines up to 250 grand a day. In Texas, State Attorney General Ken Paxton launched an investigation into five tech companies for their bans of Trump. A move that prompted Twitter to file a lawsuit asking a federal court to help defend Trump's internal editorial policies. The idea of a standalone board of non employees regulating content idea for a tech company had no precedent until when Zuckerberg first put the idea in 2018. The 20 members of Facebook, so oversight board, a mix of lawyers, academics, journalists, and former Danish prime minister, and others. One Stanford law professor, Mitch McConnell, is a former Republican appointed federal judge who was considered for the Supreme Court. The board members are not Facebook employees, but they receive compensation from a trust, which Facebook initially funded with the $130 million, $130 million grant in 2019. Compensation is not conditioned on the outcome of cases, according to the board's charter. After Facebook's ban, Facebook asked the board, or after Trump's ban, Facebook asked the board to consider two questions: Did the company issue the Did the company decide the issue correctly? 
and much of Facebook threw generally about suspensions when the user is a political leader. The case was assigned to a five-person panel. Nearly 10,000 comments poured into the panel over how it should decide Trump's case. A letter from a group of well-known law professors argued for a strong presumption for allowing speech by everyone except for calls for political violence against a democratically elected government, essentially Facebook's position. Trump is permanently banned on Twitter and he is suspended from YouTube, reflecting differences in how social media companies read and enforce their rules. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey said in January that the service faced an extraordinary and untenable circumstance. Given the risk of real-world violence, he said in a series of tweets that banning Trump was the right decision, even as he said it raised questions about how to keep the internet open to all. Twitter in 2018 amended its rules to carve out an exception for world leaders, allowing their tweets to stay up in some cases when the same speech by others would be removed. Now, since Trump was banned, the company has been gathering opinion about whether to revise the policy. YouTube suspended Trump's channel in January, preventing him from posting but leaving most existing videos in place. CEO Susan Wojcicki said in March that presidents must follow the same rules as everyone else, including a ban on assignment of violence, and she said the channel would remain suspended while the risk of violence remains elevated. We will lift the suspension of the Donald Trump channel when we determine that the risk of violence has decreased, she said in, on March 4th in an online event hosted by the Atlantic Council. Under YouTube's rules, a channel is removed entirely if it has two strikes or violations in 90 days. And all this coming as, well, as Trump launched a new platform, I'll get to that in a, in a few minutes, but there's this from Reuters, Twitter shuts down accounts for attempting to evade Trump ban. Twitter suspended several accounts this week that were set up to share statements from a new part of former President Donald Trump's website, saying he spoke its rules against evading an account ban. Trump was banned from Twitter, where he had more than 88 million followers and multiple other social media platforms. Following the deadly January 6th siege of the U.S. Capitol by his supporters, on Tuesday, a page was added to, to Trump's site, dubbed from the desk of Donald J. Trump, where he posts messages that can be shared by his audience to both Twitter and Facebook, right? as stated in a ban evasion policy. We'll take a enforcement action on accounts whose apparent intent is to replace or promote content affiliated with a suspended account, a Twitter spokesman said in a statement. A Twitter representative said they had nothing to do with the, or a Trump representative say, said they had nothing to do with the suspended accounts, which included DJT Desk, DJ Trump Desk, Desk of G DJT, and Desk of Trump One. Twitter, which has said it, that it's banned on Trump is permanent, even if he runs for office again, has said users can share content from the from the Trump page as long as it does not fall foul of its ban evasion rules. On Wednesday, Facebook's oversight board upheld Trump's or Facebook's suspension of Trump, but said the company should not have made it indefinite. The board gave Facebook six months to decide a proportionate response. Trump plans to launch his own social media platform, an advisor has said. And there's this from Forbes on that, this from Tommy Beer. Top line Twitter suspended an account created to share posts from a website recently launched by former President Donald Trump claiming that the new handle is an attempt to bypass the suspension of his personal account and the latest move by a major social media company limiting Trump's ability to spread his message. Key facts, the news site from the desk of Donald Trump went live Tuesday, as did its accompanying Twitter handle DJT Desk. By late Wednesday night, the, the account has been suspended. A Twitter spokesperson told Forbes that stated in our ban erasing policy will take enforcement action on accounts whose apparent intent is to replace or promote content affiliated by a suspended account. Key background, two days after the deadly chaos at the Capitol on January 6, which claimed the lives of five people, including a DC police officer, Trump announced, or Twitter announced a permanent suspension of Trump's personal account due to the risk of further assignment of violence. The company explained that they determined that Trump had violated their glorification of violence policy Twitter or YouTube and Facebook also banned the president on the immediate aftermath of the riots 
On Wednesday, Facebook's oversight board upheld the company's decision to ban Trump, yet it ruled it was not appropriate to impose an indefinite ban, stating Facebook has six months to either restore the account or make its suspension permanent. Trump quickly lashed out, but Facebook, Twitter, and Google have done is a total disgrace and embarrassment to our country, he said in a statement. The former president also declared social media companies should pay a political price for attempting to destroy and decimate our electoral process. In a video announcing his new site Tuesday, Trump said his new platform would serve as a place to speak freely and safely. Here's a tangent. According to Fox News, Twitter has temporarily suspended the account of Caroline Levitt, communications director for Republican Representative Elise Stefanik of New York, late Wednesday before reinstating it Thursday morning. The only reason I can think that Twitter, that Twitter would have suspended me is that I followed several Republican members of Congress and GOP activists at once that, last night, and within minutes my account had been suspended, Levitt told Fox. The account was suspended in error, a Twitter spokesperson told Fox. Yeah, right. Crucial quote, free speech, has always been t- was, free speech has been taken away from the President of the United States because the radical left lunatics are afraid of the truth, but the truth will come out anyway, bigger, stronger, bigger and stronger than ever before, Trump said in a statement on Wednesday. And like I said, all this coming up as, as, President, as Mr. Trump had launched a new platform with a video, this coming from BizPack Review, and lifetiming can be everything, and former President Donald Trump's launching of a new communications platform on Wednesday, Less than 24 hours after Facebook is, expe- is, expe- is expected to announce on Wednesday whether it will reinstate his account, Trump was banned from the social media platform in the aftermath of the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. He was also banned from YouTube. Or he was also banned on uh, he was also banned on Twitter, YouTube, and Snapchat. The introduction of the platform from the desk of Donald J. Trump which appears on his personal website is a clear indication that Trump is moving on, not expecting to get a fair shake from it, from, the, from these companies on being restated or waiting around to see. The page is set up to follow Trump or to allow Trump to post content, and followers have the, have the option to not only like the post but to share them on Facebook and Twitter. Now users cannot respond to the posts. This is just a one-way communication. The system allows Trump to communicate with his followers, a source familiar with the space told Fox News. The former president has been releasing statements on various issues as a means of communicating, but this largely depended on the media to disseminate the message. The new platform allows Trump's millions of followers who can sign up to receive alerts when a new message is posted, the option to do, to do the same. In a time of silence and lies, a beacon of freedom arises. Reads a video on a or reads a message on a video posted on the site. A place that speaks freely and safely, straight from the desk of Donald J. Trump. In the background, a news reporter is heard talking about Trump permanently banning or Twitter permanently banning the then Commander in Chief. Here's a tweet from Benny Johnson breaking Donald Trump launches from the desk of Donald J. of Donald J. Trump. Facebook's independent oversight board is expected to announce Wednesday around 9 a.m. Eastern whether it will uphold or reverse Facebook's indefinite ban of Trump. Now, for what it's worth, he was never that reliant on the social media platform. Instead, opting to use Twitter to get his message out, he had 89 million followers there. Twitter is not expected to revisit its, its decision. <coughs> its decision. We believe the risks of allowing the president to continue to use our service during this period are, are simply too great. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg said back in January, according to Fox News, the technology behind Trump's new platform appears to be powered by Campaign Nucleus, the digital ecosystem made for efficiently managing political campaigns and organizations, created by his former campaign manager, Brad Scale. President Trump's website is a great source to read to find his, his latest statements and highlights from his first term in office, but this is not a new social media platform. Senior Advisor Jason Miller told the network, we'll have additional information coming on, on that front in the very near future. An example of the fair to be expected can be seen in, in the latest post from Trump. Had women to read new polls on big shot warmonger Liz Cheney of the great state of Wyoming, the entry reads, 
She is so low that her only chance would be a vast number of people running against her, which hopefully won't happen. They never elect her much, but I, but I say she'll never run in the Wyoming election again. The pages with the website about page say, states for the, over the past four years, my administration delivered for Americans of all backgrounds like never before. Save America is about building on those accomplishments, supporting the brave conservatives who will define the future of the America First movement, the future of our party, and the future of our beloved country. Save America is also about ensuring that we will always keep America first in our foreign and domestic policy. A list of values are also included, culminating with the following. We believe in free speech and fair elections. We must ensure fair, honest, transparent, and secure elections going forward. Where every legal vote counts. While there is plenty of belly aching from the TDS crowd about the new platform being little more than a blog, one thing is certain, they are still hanging on Trump's every word. Lachlan McKay tweeted out he, he's launched a blog. Oliver Darcy tweeted, He's finally figured out how to post statements to his website. Josh Marshall tweeted, Amazing, Fox, with Trump got Fox, they call his new blog a new communications platform. This turbulent couple is getting back together. Jed Ligon tweeted out, Spoiler, this new communications platform is a website. Media Matters tweeted out, This is a Tumblr. Picklevick tweeted out, when make communication, that's how dictators, because that's how dictators function. Michael Barely tweeted out, hold on, it's only, it's only one way communication, you can't post or reply. How is that a communication platform? Well, it sounds like loads of fun. I'm sure supporters will eat it up and send him donates for the privilege to read his blog. And Tristan pointed out, I can't wait until they hack this crap. Now, I'm thinking that this is part of the Frank, you know, that this might be like Frank's speech. I'm not totally sure. You know, you know, we'll just have to wait and see on that. Leave a comment be below for what do you what do you think about this? You know, are you are you gonna pay attention to it? Are you gonna no? Are you going to to reply and and even share share his works? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday, I brought up the fact that Facebook had sustain their banishment of Donald Trump from their platform. And I still have more on that today in the form of a few opinion pieces. This first one coming from foxnews.com and it's Senator Bill Hagerty, Facebook versus Trump. Big tech censorship's regime is out of control. Here's how we fix it. Facebook's decision to uphold the suspension of former President Donald Trump's account underscores that big tech co corporations are attempting to control what the American people are allowed to say and hear. Last week, I introduced the 21st Century Free Speech Act, which would ensure that our modern public square is governed by the First Amendment principles of free speech and open exchange of ideas, not the, whim of big, not the whims of big tech censors. Facebook's disappointing announcement today highlights the urgent need for this legislation. Dominant, ubiquitous big tech platforms are increasingly choosing which speakers and messages are approved for public discussion using opaque, inconsistent, and politically motivated moderation practices that change by the day. So here we are with an unelected and unaccountable oversight board of academics, journalists, lawyers, and activists determining whether a former United States president who, re who recently received 74 million votes from the American public may participate in the modern day public square. As a former U.S. ambassador to, to, to Japan, I dealt on a daily basis with China. This type of censorship regime is what I would have expected from the Chinese Communist Party, not Silicon Valley. It is un-American. Censorship like this tramples upon the foundational principles of free speech, freedom of thought and belief, free assembly, and the open exchange of ideas that have always animated American education and in progress. In 2020, then President Trump ran not just against Joe Biden, but also against the establishment media and big tech. In my assessment, big tech, which ran interference for the Biden campaign on numerous fronts, including by blocking the account of the New York Post and reports reporting on Hunter Biden, was the most formidable opponent of all. 
In private, several of my Democrat colleagues have expressed similar concerns to me regarding the power these big tech corporations now wield over American life. They understand that the tide can turn, can turn quickly. Today, Democrats' political adversary is censored, but tomorrow they may become the victim of that same censorship. That is why censorship is fundamentally inconsistent with American values. As Justice Clarence Thomas noted in a recent Supreme Court opinion, common carriers such as trains or telephone networks, which are essential to everyday goings on and connecting people and information, have historically been subject to special regulations including a general requirement to serve all comers without discrimination. Telephone companies do not shut off your phone line based on what political views you express during calls. The same logic should apply today to big tech. This is especially true given big tech's unique control over today's public square. A series of court decisions has limited the extent to which political figures can delete comments or by users from, from interacting with their social media accounts noting that the First Amendment does not permit politicians to pick and choose who interacts with them in the public square. Likewise, we should not allow big tech to decide which political figures are allowed to participate in the public square. It is absurd that President Trump is legally prohibited from limiting Twitter individual Twitter users' comments to him, while Twitter is, is permitted to ban President Trump from, from the platform entirely. My legislation is necessary to, include, to address this issue because our laws haven't kept pace with technology. The statutes governing free speech online haven't been updated in, the, in a quarter century. Since it was passed in 1996, Section 230 has been stretched well beyond its, its, its original intent, which was to promote the free exchange of ideas online and, and specific types of friendly, friendly moderation, and to a license for companies like Facebook and Twitter to censor. In its effort to, to encourage family-friendly moderation, Congress specifically permitted moderation of obscene, lewd, or excessively violent content. It also per permitted moderation of otherwise object objectionable content, and Big Tech has exploited this vague term, using it as a, as a license to censor whatever it pleases. This was Congress's purpose, or this was not Congress's purpose, nor can Congress have then imagined the behemoth tech corporations that now dominate our ability to communicate. The 21st Century Free Speech Act would 1. Abolish Section 230's license to censor. 2. Treat big tech platforms with more than 100 million active monthly users worldwide like a common carrier that must provide reasonable, non-discriminatory access to all consumers to prevent political censorship. And 3. Require big tech platforms to disclose their content management and moderation practices to users so that consumers can better assess the information they receive. Specifically, my bill would abolish Section 230 in favor of a liability protection platform that restores that section's original intent, updated based on the effects of the enormous technological change over the past 25 years. Liability protection would remain for third-party speech and family-friendly moderation of specifically defined obscene or violent content without providing limitless special protection for a platform's own speech and viewpoint censorship. This legislation provides the liability protection necessary to drive continued innovation without giving companies a license to censor speech on political, religious, or other grounds. Ultimately, the 21st Century Free Speech Act is about promoting free speech, thought, and an exchange of ideas. It, it's about entrusting Americans rather than big tech companies and their independent oversight boards to determine what information to consume, share, and believe. Now, I agree with Senator Haggerty uh, on that, and, you know, definitely won't wonder what's happening. I mean, I've had a few friends complain that they've had their had, had their Facebook and or Twitter or even YouTube accounts banned. And there are some people that say that no, your First Amendment has not been taken away. That's not totally true because, uh, I mean, why have a First Amendment for social media if you can't use it. You know, I mean, 
I mean, we've had, well, 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 ever since November 3rd, we've had, of 2020, we've had probably, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm just guesstimating here, probably about two to three million people lose their Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube accounts, and so they've gone to to frequent other less known or less known social media platforms like Parler and Gab, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey. I mean, if you look at my own social media contact list, which I will post in a in a few minutes, you'll see that I myself am on about 20 to 30 other platforms. And then we have this also from, politi from political.com. And it reads, Facebook's speech policies are even more arbitrary than we thought. The case of Facebook v. v Trump is an open invitation to, pol to political actors to swoop in to reduce the social network's power or write new rules for it. This is from Rich Lowry, who is editor of National Review and a contributing editor with Politico. It is said that medieval scholastic philosophers debated how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. If so, they didn't have anything on the amorphous and, ten and tendentious deliberations of Facebook regarding who is allowed to post on its social network, most pertinently the former president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. On January 7, the day after the Capitol riot, Facebook blocked Trump from posting indefinitely. It then kicked the matter to its oversight board, saying, you decide. On Wednesday, the oversight board replied, no, no, you decide. Hold on a minute. If Facebook had set out to demonstrate that it has awesome power over speech in the United States, including speech at the at the core of the nation's polit political debate, and is wielding that power arbitrarily, indeed has no idea what its own rules truly are or should be, it wouldn't have handled the, the question any, any differently. The case of Facebook v. Trump is an open invitation to political actors to swoop in to reduce the social network's power <coughs> or write new rules for it, and indeed, Trump-friendly Republicans are making no cause for action. It's not clear what the best solution is, if the, or even if there is a solution, but there's obviously a problem. Full disclosure, my publication, National Review, is part of the Facebook News tab. In its wisdom, the Facebook Oversight Board said it, it, that it was not permissible for Facebook to impose an indeterminate standardless policy or penalty of indefinite suspension on Trump, then upheld the suspension. It called on Facebook to review the suspension within six months and make some suggestions toward developing rules to follow in such cases, which has an Alice in Wonderland verdict to it first. Verdict rules, or verdict for first, rules about whether the verdict is correct or not later. The oversight board underlines the most astonishing fact that in reaching its most momentous free speech decision over ever in this country, in determining whether a former president of the United States can use its platform or not, Facebook made it up on the fly. In applying this penalty, the board writes over the suspension, Facebook did not follow a clear published procedure. This is like the U.S. Supreme Court handing on decisions in the absence of a written constitution, or a home paid umpire calling balls and strikes without an agreed upon strike zone. The two Trump posts on January 6th prompted the suspension. Trump's video posted at 4.21 p.m. that day was too little too late, but it was an incitement. After expressing disgraceful, I feel your pain sentiments about the rioters. Trump urged them to go home and go home in peace. He followed this up with his egregious 6.15 p.m. post about these kinds of things happening when elections are stolen, but said in that one, go home with love and peace. Facebook interpreted these posts as violations of the community standards on dangerous individuals and organizations, which do not allow organizations or individuals that proclaim a violent mission or are, or are engaged in violence to have a presence on Facebook. 
The standards set the examples of mass murder, human trafficking, and, and organized violence or criminal activity. The standards also forbid content that expresses support or praise for people involved in such activities, which is where Trump's post supposedly caused the line or crossed the line. But this is a tenuous violation. Facebook would have more credibility enforcing it if there was evidence that scoured his platform removed the posts of people who expressed sentiments during the writing associated with the George Floyd protest, like, I understand your frustration with policing and our system of justice and admire your passion, but please don't, learn or, don't loot or burn things. If Facebook just wanted to say that Trump is often noxious and dishonest in his social media postings, that'd be understandable, but this would put it in the inherently subjective and highly contentious business of deciding which politicians are worthy and truthful and which are not. Mark Zuckerberg had it right the first time when, not too long ago, he was arguing it wasn't Facebook's role to circumscribe the nation's political debate. Some Republicans, like former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, are saying in response to the social network's Trump decision that Facebook should be broken up. It's not evident what authority the federal government would have to do that. More targeted attempts to force viewpoint neutrality on social media platforms might have unintended consequences and would raise their own free speech concerns. The companies would argue that they can't be compelled to hold speech that they disapprove of. But there can be no doubt that Facebook, already beset on all sides, has hung a lantern on this unsettling combination of power and caprice. And that last sentence is totally true, and, you know, because, I mean, and it, it had been mentioned before, you know, with with the mainstream media, you know, ninety percent of the of the mainstream media companies or ch channels are owned by six major companies. You know, there's a there's a post on that somewhere. I'll have to find that and probably post it up in another video. But you know, why is that? Why is, and, and okay, you go to you go to, you go to the phone, and you turn Facebook on, and you look at the bottom, and it has WhatsApp, it has Instagram, and a couple of others. Uh, I think mess well, definitely Messenger, and one other that I don't understand. So, right in the palm of your hand, you have Facebook basically owning about five or six of the sites that that you use. You know, so I think they should be broken up. You know, I think probably a couple of others should be broken up, like Google may, maybe, you know, and... I think Yahoo's already broken up, so that's not so that's neither here here nor there. But definitely Facebook should be broken up. Probably get more on that in a few or rather in another video, but there's this article from foxbusiness.com. Facebook oversight board upholds Trump ban but calls indefinite suspension not appropriate. Decision comes after Trump rolled out a new communications platform from the desk of Donald J. Trump. Facebook's oversight, and, and, and by the way, this is by Brooke Singman. Facebook's oversight board on Wednesday upheld former President Donald Trump's ban from Facebook and Instagram, but said it was not appropriate for, for Facebook to impose the indeterminate, the indeterminate and standardized policy or penalty of an indefinite suspension. The board has upheld Facebook's decision on January 7, 2021 to restrict then-President Donald Trump's access to posting content on his Facebook page and an Instagram account, the board announced Wednesday morning. But the board gave Facebook six months to review the arbitrary indefinite ban, saying in a tweet that the company violated its own rules. Facebook cannot make up the rules as it goes, and anyone concerned about its power should be concerned about allowing this, the board said in a statement. Having clear rules that apply to all users and Facebook is essential for ensuring the company treats users fairly. The board in January accepted a case referral from Facebook to examine the ban, as well as to provide policy recommendations on suspensions 
when the user is a political leader. Facebook's normal penalties include removing the validating content, imposing a time-bound period of suspension, or permanently disabling the page and account the board said Wednesday, insisting that Facebook review this matter to determine and justify a proportionate response that is consistent with the rules that are applied to other users of its platform. As for recommendations on suspensions for high-profile users like Trump, the board says that it is not always useful to draw a firm distinction between political leaders and other influential users, recognizing that other users with large audiences can also contribute to serious risks of harm. While the same rule should apply to all users, content matters, or context matters when assessing the probability and innocence of harm, or imminence of harm, the board said, when posts by influential users pose a high probability of imminent harm, Facebook should act quickly to enforce its rules. Now, although Facebook explained that it did not apply its newsworthiness allowance in this case, the board called on Facebook to address wide, widespread confusion about how decisions relating to influential users are made. The board added that considerations of newsworthiness should not take priority when urgent action is needed to prevent significant harm. The board also urged Facebook to publicly explain the rules when it uses, or that it uses when it imposes account-level sanctions against influential users, saying the rules should ensure that when Facebook imposes a time-limited suspension on the account of an influential user to reduce the risk of significant harm, it will assess whether the risk has receded before the suspension ends. If Facebook identifies that the user poses a serious risk of inciting imminent violence, discrimination, or other lawless action at that time, another time-bound suspension should be imposed when such measures are necessary to protect public safety and proportionate to the risk, the board added. The board noted that heads of state and other high officials of government can have a greater power to cause harm than other people. If a head of state or a high government official has repeatedly posted messages that pose a risk of harm under intentional human rights norms, Facebook should suspend the account for a period sufficient to protect against imminent harm, the board said. Suspension periods should be long enough to deter misconduct and may, in appropriate cases, include account or page deletion. Facebook responding to the board's decision was they said they believe the move to ban Trump in January was necessary and right, and are pleased that the board has recognized that the unprecedented circumstances justify the measure we took. Facebook said it will now consider the board's decision and determine an action that is clear and proportionate. In the meantime, Mr. Trump's accounts remain suspended, Facebook said, adding that they are reviewing the board's recommendations on policies with surrounding political figures. In a statement Wednesday, Trump called the social media bans a total disgrace and an embarrassment to our country. Free speech has been taken away from the President of the United States because the radical left lunatics are afraid of the truth, but the truth will come out anyway bigger and stronger than ever before, Trump said. The people of our country will not stand for it. These corrupt social media companies must pay a political price and must never again be allowed to destroy and decimate our electoral process. The board's decision came in, comes after Trump on Tuesday afternoon rolled out a new communications platform from the desk of Donald J. Trump. Now this space allows Trump to post comments, images, and videos, and allows followers to share the former president's posts to Facebook and Twitter, though it doesn't have a feature letting users reply or engage with, with Trump's post. The technology is powered by Campaign Nucleus, the digital, the digital ecosystem made for efficiently managing political campaigns and organizations created by his former campaign manager, Brad Parscale. This is just a one-way communication one, so it's familiar with the space told Fox News. The system allows Trump to communicate with his followers. Trump's new platform surfaced Tuesday after advisors had told Fox News that the former president planned to move forward to create a social media platform of his own after being banned from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Snapchat after the Capitol riot. Mr. President Trump's website is a great resource to find his latest statements and highlights from his first term in office, but this is not a new social media platform, Senior Advisor Jason Miller told Fox News. We'll have additional information coming on that front in the very near future. Facebook moved to block Trump indefinitely after the, after the January 6th riot in the U.S. Capitol with CEO Mark Zuckerberg said they were writing that they believe the risks of allowing the president to continue to use our service during this period are simply too great. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and YouTube announced they were permanently banning Trump after the riot, 
Since then, Facebook has taken steps to limit Trump from appearing on the platform, even through other accounts. Last week, Facebook removed a video of an interview with Trump conducted by his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, saying any content in the voice of Donald Trump would be scrubbed from the social media platform. A group of Trump officials were sent a Facebook from a, or an email from a Facebook employee before the interview was posted, warning that any content posted on Facebook and Instagram and the voice of Donald Trump is not currently allowed on our platforms, including new posts with Trump speaking, and warned that it will be removed if posted, resulting in, in additional limitations on the accounts that posted it. This guidance applies to all campaign accounts and pages, including Team Trump, other campaign messaging videos on our platforms and other surrogates. The email posted on Instagram by Trump son Eric Trump said, a source familiar, with the, with a source familiar con, confirmed the authenticity of the messages to Fox News. Trump Twitter wrote in a blog post in January that the ban was due to the risk of further incitement of violence. For years before and after, or before and during his presidency, Trump used Twitter to communicate directly to the American people, bypassing the media. But the former president told Fox Business last week that the press release statement that he has been putting out since Ben, they're getting his message out in a more elegant way than a tweet. Now I just put out releases that everybody prints what I say, Trump told host Maria Baderomo. I think it's actually much more elegant than Twitter, and it gets the word out just as well. And everyone can do that, unfortunately. Now, it's good that he's getting the word out, and, you know, there's a new site called frankspeech.com, which is out and I, I've been on that a, a couple of times. A couple of times they need to do some work on that, but yeah, so that, so it, it should be very interesting as to what will come during that. And then there, and there's also this article from the LA Times, if I can get it right. Sorry about that, I had a little bit of an incident. Here we go. Opinion Facebook Supreme Court slaps Trump, but tells Facebook to be better. In a lengthy decision upholding Facebook's temporary ban on former President Trump, the social network's oversight board called out several of the company's most aggravating traits, including its, tra including its seemingly arbitrary approach to its rules, its lack of transparency, and its bizarre tolerance for conduct by politicians to, or that's so bad it's, it's newsworthy. If the ruling brings out changes on these fronts, We'll all be able to, we, we, we'll all be able to afford, irregardless of whether Trump ultimately gets to revive his moribund Facebook page. But the larger issue, and the one that's, that the company's independent appeals panel didn't tackle directly, is the raw power Facebook can to people capable of attracting a large audience. The company's scale and reach are, the, are in themselves a problem, given the tools the platform uses offer, or offers users to precisely target the people most receptive to potentially misleading and inflammatory messages. Facebook suspended Trump indefinitely after a su supporter stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6. Now, the ride wasn't the problem. It was Trump's first two responses on social media, in which he praised and defended the incursion and complained yet again about the election being stolen from him. The comments were so inflammatory, Twitter banned Trump on the spot and Facebook cut him off indefinitely. Facebook then asked its oversight board, currently a 20-member panel of academics, human rights advocates and other luminaries from around the world to address two aspects of Trump's suspension. Was it the right decision in light of Facebook's commitment to, uh, to voice and safety? And what rules should govern suspensions of accounts put belonging to political leaders? On the first question, the board said no, not because Trump's statements were defensible, but because Facebook's rules make no mention of the possibility of a suspension of indeterminate length. Instead, those rules require Facebook to set a time period for suspensions or to terminate the user's account. In other words, if the board told Facebook they couldn't make a responses on the fly. Facebook has been playing catch up with its rules ever since researchers found that the platform has been used for an aggressive disinformation campaign by Russian agents 
and for and other foreign interests in the 2016 election, but Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg has been lulled to apply those rules to politicians who are some of the most widely followed and thus most influential people on the site. As the Twitter belatedly started labeling Trump's false claims in May 2020, Zuckerberg told CNBC that he didn't think online platforms should be arbiters of truth. And Zuckerberg's framing this is a First Amendment issue, but providing a microphone and an amplifier for deceit isn't fighting the good fight for free speech. People do, in fact, have a free speech right to lie in certain, in certain circumstances. But no one is entitled to have his or her views spread over Facebook's vast network. It's entirely up to Facebook to decide the rules governing who gets to use the platform it built and how they get to use it. The boy made some observations that Facebook and Zuckerberg in particular must heed. First, it said the free speech rights of political figures is no greater than anyone else's. And while the public needs to be informed, the board noted, international human rights standards, the ones Facebook says it hews to, expect state actors to condemn violence and to provide accurate information to the public on matters of, of public interest, while also correcting misinformation, meaning for or serving in office should not be a license to broadcast lies on Facebook's platform. As for Trump's suspension, the board called on the company to police its network better instead of resorting to blunt instruments like, like, like suspensions. At a minimum, this would mean developing ineffective, ineffective or effective mechanisms to avoid amplifying speech that poses risks of imminent violence, discrimination, or other lawless action, where possible and proportionate, rather than ban banning the speech outright, the board said. Good luck with that. Facebook already has to employ an army of content moderators to review questionable posts, along with relying on artificial intelligence to identify problematic content before it's widely seen. And despite all that effort, does somebody really believe the platform is free from disinformation and, and hate speech? I mean, it's algorithms and the scale of Facebook's own worst enemies on that front. The board told Facebook to revisit Trump's suspension within six months to decide whether to extend or end it. The penalty must be based on the gravity of the violation and the prospect of future harm, the board wrote. It must also be consistent with Facebook's rules for severe violations, which must, which, which must in turn be clear, necessary, and proportionate. The clear part has been difficult for, for Facebook. Given the steady evolution of its rules and, uh, and its occasionally ad hoc responses, as in the case here, it feeds a sense that, networks, that the network's inconsistency is grounded in self-interest rather than in the interest of users. Twitter has an enormous following on Facebook, or Trump, has, and Trump had an, an, an enormous following on Facebook, with 35 million users subscribing to his post and 24 million to his offerings on his sister network Instagram. His campaign was also the biggest spender on Facebook ads, dropping more than $100 million in the 22 months leading up to the election by BC7 Los Angeles discount. Now, one can't help but suspect that Facebook's refusal to fact check politicians' ads and its newsworthiness loophole were based on at least as much as ad re or on ad revenue ambitions as First Amendment ideals. The oversight board added its voice to those of many Facebook critics who view or who demand more consistency, transparency, and yes, truly principled approaches to tackling the problems on the platform. But those steps are just where the conversation starts. Conversation starts with those steps, and it also continues on this on this platform as well. You know, as, after all, I do have a comment section below. Yes, it is moderated for for spam and sometimes obscene words, but other than that, you know, it's free game, you know, anyone, anyone can comment, so just have at it. And you can also comment to me on my other social media platforms. I have my email here. I'm also on Telegram if you want, if, if, you, if you use Telegram and want to follow me there. Not only, am I, not only am I on Facebook and Twitter, but I'm also on some of the other more unknown, like MeWe, Gab, Parler, USA Life, Wimkin, Uber Kraken, and on up, Minds, few new ones, Codius, Connections, 
an old one called Gold Skulls. I also have social media comments um, with, with Discuss and Vucal if you want to follow me there. Social media platforms, I'm on YouTube, BitChute, D Dailymotion, Vimeo. I'm also on Twitch and DLive. Might do a, might, I don't know, I might do a couple of, of live videos on there. Who knows? I'm also on brand new tube, Rumble, Pilled, Vaughn, Bradion, Tiger. I also have a few audio social media platforms, which I not use it as of yet, but might just do so. Speaker, Podbean, Stutter, I started off on Block Talk Radio. I also have a Gilded server if you use that. And if you're so interested, I also have a civics board and a new, and a new media message board, which you can use to, to contact me on there. So export is about government and and the inner workings of of government. New media message board is well fo fo focused on this. I also have a, a few crack researchers in the background that that send me stuff. Both boards are relatively new, so. Hop on and enjoy that fun. And like I said, you know, leave a comment, leave a comment below what what you think about about former President Trump's man on Facebook. Do you think it's right? Do you think it's not right? You know, you, you know, I are, are, are you gonna follow him to other social media platforms? You know, and I'll see you in the and I'll see you in the next video. And that's going to do it for the news for this week. I am Mick Bulo. Again, if you like what you watch, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Also subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell an enemy or two even. And I will be back next week. Until next time, peace.